Hey Wapters, Mr. Lassiter here with you, and in tonight's video, uh, we're going to look at the Russian Empire uh, in this time period, 1450 to 1750. So let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, of course, where we last probably left off in Russia, we were looking at the dissolution of Mongol power there, the end of Mongol rule. Uh, the city of Moscow had become the foundation for a new state, uh, basically the uh, state of Muscovy, um, which basically absorbs the territory of the Kievan state uh, and Novgorod uh, in, in the west. Um, they, they continue, they kind of conquer some of the Khanates around, um, and ultimately we see the establishment of a Muscovite ruler, Ivan the Terrible, or Ivan IV, uh, who takes the title of Tsar in 1547. But these territorial conquests, um, you know, basically create an empire, a Russian empire, not necessarily a Russian kind of state or nation. Um, early on, most of the power uh, in Russia had actually resided with local aristocrats who were known as boyars. And we're going to come, we're going to talk about these guys now and then again in a little bit. Uh, basically, they were a class of, of aristocrats. Ivan the Terrible himself does not trust them at all. Um, uh, and he thought that his empire might be in danger because of feuding or disloyal aristocrat, uh, aristocrats. Um, Ivan the Third, before Ivan the Fourth, and Ivan the Fourth himself, um, tried to find ways to weaken the boyars uh, and create a much more centralized state. Ivan the Third deported and executed thousands of boyars uh, in the city of Novgorod. Uh, and he basically replaces them with people who are loyal to him. And Ivan IV, the grandson of Ivan III, uh, applied the policy to a much larger portion of the empire. Uh, he exiled boyars from the state. Uh, he cut off their sources of wealth and their ability to have local military power. Um, and he created a policing army directly under his authority that were basically not subject to the local aristocrats' oversight. Um, he called this the Oprichnina, uh, the Oprichnina, O-P-R-I-C-H-N-I-N-A. And they could kill people with impunity. They could terrorize the empire. Um, and, and this is one of, the way that, one of the ways that he is able to cement his power as czar uh, by weakening any opposition to him. Uh, needless to say, this will eventually lead to an unstable, demoralized empire. Um, and the boyars, as we'll see later in this lecture, are going to um, are going to come back and fight. Um, but as I said, uh, getting that kind of out of the way, uh, Russia was an empire at first, uh, and the natural direction for Russia to expand once it kind of centralized uh, the power over Muscovy um, was to expand to the east. Um, the expansion into Siberia was led by a group of people known as the Cossacks, who defeated the only political power in the region, the Khanate of Sibir. Uh, and it took land from small hunting and fishing uh, groups of native people. Uh, it was valued for its furs and timber. Um, and after 1700, uh, Siberia was valued for gold, coal, iron. Um, and then, of course, since it was literally the middle of nowhere, it was used as a penal colony. In the 1650s, the expanding Russian Empire met the expanding Qing Empire uh, of China in Mongolia, Central Asia, and, uh, and the like. Uh, treaties, though, between these two powers in 1689 and 1727 basically had the effect of weakening the Mongols in the region and focusing Russian expansion eastward toward the Pacific coast across North America. They basically didn't have to worry about this other group, and so they could continue their expansion. And Russia will continue to expand. As you can see in this map, you see the lands added uh, up until basically 1800, and then there'll be some added afterwards. As far as society and politics, um, as the empire, the Russian empire expanded, it naturally incorporates a diverse set of peoples, cultures, and religions. Uh, and this would, of course, create some internal tensions within, within the Russian empire. Um, Another thing to look at are the Cossacks, who were warriors and mercenaries, basically who belonged to close-knit bands, uh, and they would just basically make temporary alliances with whoever could pay for their services. Um, 
And even though they performed important services for the Russian Empire, they still had a great uh, degree of autonomy. Uh, threats and invasions by Sweden and Poland and internal disputes uh, among the Russian aristocracy in the 17th century eventually led to a lot of trouble in this empire. Uh, this is where kind of the boyars come back in. Um, the boyars, the Russian aristocracy, of course, there were a lot of disputes and they were very much not a fan of these old Muscovite rulers. And so they kind of band together and lead kind of an overthrow of this old, uh, this old ruling family, old ruling group. Um, and in its place, uh, these boyars establish uh, the Romanov dynasty, and they enthroned Mikhail Romanov in 1613. As the power of the Romanov rose, uh, the freedom of Russian peasants, though, falls. In 1649, huge change here uh, in Russia, we see peasants legally transformed into serfs. Um, this is a major change, and serfdom is going to last in Russia for quite some time. Basically, they become tied to the land, uh, lose a great deal of freedoms, um, and are going to be the main source of labor in, in Russia. One of the most significant rulers in Russia at this time, um, we're going to see further changes under this guy, is Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great was... Uh, now he he's you know he's got the name the great so you can kind of get an idea of what they think of him, um, but he gained that notoriety uh, in warfare and with building connections in Europe. Uh, for example, he fought the Ottomans in an attempt to gain warm water ports um, and liberate Istanbul from Muslim rule. Uh, rule, of course, he wasn't successful in either of those, but he was much more successful in the Great Northern War, in which Russia defeats Sweden. Uh, in order to control the Baltic and establish more direct contacts between Russia and Europe. Keep in mind that up until this time, Russia was not European. It didn't really have any connections with Europe. Uh, it was seen as very different. That goes way back to our study of uh, Russia aligning themselves with more of the Byzantine orthodoxy rather than Roman Catholicism. They're going to be much more tied to the East than the West. But this is a major change. There's a port on the Baltic Sea. Now you can all of a sudden trade with Western Europe and establish European connections. Peter himself was very interested in Europe. Uh, he constructs a new capital city uh, in St. Petersburg, which was much more Western than any other uh, Russian city. Um, and he sought to bring in more and more Westernization. He even uh, would took time where he would go under, basically go incognito to, to Western Europe and learn techniques like shipbuilding and learn about their structure of their government and all these things. He would come back in Western clothes and begin wearing Western style um, clothing and spreading Western ideas and Western technology and culture. And he wanted to use this um, to, to increase uh, and, and strengthen Russia and strengthen his own power in government. He got a lot of ideas from those uh, um, absolutist governments in Europe. Um, as an autocratic ruler, um, Peter himself brought the Russian Orthodox Church under his control. Uh, that's one way he was able to strengthen uh, and centralize this government. Um, he built industrial plants to serve the military. Uh, he increased the burden of taxes and labor on the serfs um, and for the basic, you know, uh, who they relied on for the basic production of goods. And so Peter definitely was a very strong ruler. It wasn't like he was the nicest guy, but he was big into this idea of bringing in European technology to strengthen his power, um, as seen definitely in, in the strengthening the military through industrial plants. Uh, the empire, of course, continues to expand and consolidate over time um, under these Romanov rulers. Uh, Russian expansion in Alaska and the American Northwest was driven by the fur trade, same thing that we saw in Siberia. Uh, control of natural resources of Siberia put Russians in, in a position to dominate the fur and shipping industries of the, North, uh, the northern Pacific Ocean.
During the reign of Catherine the Great, Russia had basically built up the world's largest land empire. Uh, of course, it was based on uh, controlling a large territory, based on agriculture and logging, fishing, and of course, the fur trade. Uh, they successfully, Catherine the Great is very well known for successfully fighting a war with the Ottomans to gain warm water ports, which I'll show you in the next slide, and even expanding into Poland, uh, leading to more of a connection between Russia and and, uh, and Europe. And you can see some of those gains um, that Russia makes uh, with warm water ports uh, down here on uh, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, etc. Uh, the... We also want to think kind of about what, how Russia fits in with, with the rest of the world and look at some comparisons. Uh, as far as compi uh, political comparisons, between 1500 and 1800, uh, with China and Russia, they both grow dramatically. They both uh, control more territory and their population grows during this time. Uh, if we're comparing Russia and China, for example, the two regions we've studied most recently, to the European maritime empires, uh, they certainly um, had much greater territory, uh, much looser administrations, uh, and they were land-based versus the, say, Portuguese, Dutch, French, and English empires, which uh, were controlled much more tightly uh, and had kind of a global control. Uh, in terms of Japan, we might not call it a true empire, um, but... Uh, the, the, I, Japan and Russia themselves definitely make greater progress in improving their military than, say, China does. Uh, of Japan, Russia, and China, Russia, we would probably say, uh, did the most to build up its imperial navy um, and in controlling the, the North Pacific and, and achieving warm water ports uh, and controlling the region of the Baltic. As far as cultural, social, and economic comparisons, we really will look mostly at China and Russia and think about uh, these two regions, these two land-based empires. Uh, they both pursued policies that tolerate diversity, and they promote cultural assimilation. Though. That's, that's key. Uh, even though both uh, Russian and Chinese leaders were willing to use foreign ideas and technologies, they still saw their own cultures as superior. Uh, and they both actually still see a very hierarchical and oppressive social system where the lowest classes uh, are uh, basically living a very heavily taxed and oppressed lifestyle. Um, but Russia is, is very unique in this time period. It's uh, lots of stuff going on there. It's growing as an empire, um, and it's, it's beginning to find what we might consider today is a Russian identity. Uh, 